Welcome to the Bright Vibe Podcast. At Bright Vibe, we believe everyone deserves to be happy. But in today's world, everywhere you turn, there is division and negativity. At Bright Vibe, we have created a global movement to bring 8 million people together who are inspired to live bright, live bold, and share bright vibes. Alone, it can be hard to change, but together we can change the world. Welcome to the Bright Vibe Podcast. Tom Henschel, welcome to the show today. So happy to have you on. I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> All right. So you've got a very interesting background. Uh, you've been an executive coach for uh, over 25 years, so 25 plus years for some very big companies that we would all know, uh, you know, HP, Sony, Toyota, UCLA, Warner Brothers. Before that, though, you're professionally trained as an actor. Is that accurate to say? That is very accurate to say. Yeah. 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 And so you're a well sought after business coach. But I'm, I want to get into this and kind of make that tie between uh, Juilliard, which I think I have never heard of an acting school other than Juilliard. So, but I know that they're out there, but I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the, it's kind of like the Yale or the Harvard of acting schools. Is that fair to say? That is very fair to say. Okay, and the so people was... at Yale would be really pissed about that, but yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad I said that. So I don't know who I've offended, but I'm happy that I'm happy that that brought something up for them. Then you have a very successful podcast called the look and sound of leadership. And you've been doing that since 2008. And so we'll visit about that as well. So yeah, Juilliard to business. How did that, how'd that work? How, how did you go from kind of being, because you were on, you, you were on television, movies, shows. I mean, you were, you're, you're the real deal. You're, you know, that you got paid to, to do that profession, do that art. And then what happened that you decided, Hey, I want to get into business coaching. Those things seem kind of detached. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I first said I wanted to be an actor when I was like 10. Nice. It, yeah. And so there I was in my 30s still, you know, actually making a living and putting my uh -huh. kid in private school and buying a uh -huh. house. And but I had a feeling, Matt, I just had a feeling that, you know, when I was going to be 60 years old or something, that my television career wasn't going to support my family. And oh. I did not want to be one of those 60 year old guys, you know, fighting for his health care and doing two shows on some sitcom. You know, I just didn't oh. want to be that guy. Oh, OK, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll do something else. And I've always taught. I mean, even after Julie, mm. during Juilliard, I, I used to teach during the summers. And when I came out to Los Angeles, I taught at a, at a conservatory. So I mm. thought, oh, I'll go teach. And mm -hmm. I uh, taught for a couple semesters at a university in their drama department. And I was mm. so miserable. I was so <laughs> unhappy. It was such a bad fit for me. And I thought, oh, yeah. I'm screwed. Like, am I mm. going to end up like teaching high school drama? I really didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I found this thing called corporate training. Mm. I don't even remember how I found out about it, but you know, I'd never had a job. So I didn't know there was a thing called corporate training. Right, right, right. But then I thought, oh, okay, I'll teach grownups. And I went and taught presentation skills, oh. which was a perfect, you know. I mean, yeah, that that's a, now that's a perfect right? tie-in, right? Yeah, because you right? learned, yeah, the acting and, and verbal annunciation, projection, right? All that stuff, right? All I've never been stuff. into acting school, but I'm assuming that's what they teach you. <laughs> that's part of it. You bet, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then literally at the very first job I ever got that was my gig, I wasn't a mm -hmm. subcontractor, I was like, this mm -hmm. was mine. Mm -hmm. The HR person came up to me and said, we have three division presidents. Uh, our our board chair would really like you to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, whatever. Oh, you know? right. Like coaching them specifically on how to present. Is that? His, the board chair wanted them to be more presidential. Got it. Okay. And I was like, that made sense to me. It was like right. playing a role. I was like, yep, okay, right. I, sure. So I was coaching before it was called coaching. Wow. And very cool. Yeah. And then I actually got pulled into a coaching company and mm. got taught to coach. And mm -hmm. suddenly I was coaching and it was oh, like, wow. Yeah. That's what oh. I said. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> you woke up then, day and you're like, wow, I've got an actual real gig, right? I've yeah. got a job. I've got a, I'm, I'm an adult now. <laughs> yeah. And it was interesting because for a while, for about five years, I was doing both. Oh. I was still shooting television and I was, you know, doing my consulting thing. And right. it, was a little, it was a little wacky, but it was fun. <laughs> Did people recognize you from TV? Did they ever go like, hey, wait, you're that guy I just saw on TV? Every now and then. I got a call oh. late one night from a CEO and, and this timestamp on the voicemail was like 1130 at night. And she said, mm -hmm. okay what just happened? I'm sitting in my bed <laughs> and I got the TV on and you right. just showed up on murder. Shooter. <laughs> what the hell? I love it. I love I it. I did too. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. 
Oh, do you, do you use your uh, do you use your own uh, like movie clips in some of your presentations that are just like? <laughs> no, I've never done that. Well, I, I never have. That would be kind of cool if you like you were doing a presentation. You're like, oh, I want to show you this clip, and then it's you, right? You're acting, <laughs> acting in the deal. So what do you do currently with, uh, you know, is it typically still presentation skills? So I work with both. A lot of times what ends up happening is I'll be working one-on-one -on -one with a leader and she'll say to me, you know, you should do my offsite. Or I want people to get to know you and she'll have me do three of her direct reports, you know, coach three of her direct reports. So it can be either. I love the teamwork, the do, uh, coaching teams and doing offsites and stuff. It's fantastic. I love that. And and typically, because I think it's so important, you know, and the more I do this, you know, I've, I've been in business all my life. And the more I'm in business, the more it's like, it seems like a no brainer to have a coach or to have a support team or have a have a team peer group around you to give you perspective, right? It's because it's like, if you're a professional, if we call ourselves professionals, professionals have coaches like especially in the sporting world, right? But everywhere you look, really, anybody who's functioning, super high functioning has uh, actors, right? Actors have coaches, vocalists have coaches, professional athletes have coaches, and high-level executives have coaches. I think sometimes we don't give that enough credit. It's like if you really want to be successful in any part of your life, you got to have somebody that you're learning from. Otherwise, it's just theory. I, or at least this is my opinion. No, I think it's true. I have been coaching long enough that, I've watched it change that in the okay. beginning, mm -hmm. when I started coaching, I was with a group of people mm -hmm. and our challenge was to get people to stop thinking of coaching as punishment. <laughs> Your time Be out, huh? <laughs> well, but people, listen, the truth was that mm -hmm. when, when they had a, an executive who was like just creating all kinds of disruption, they right. would get them coach oh, before, gotcha. before they fired him. Got right. It. So it was like a yeah plan of action. It was kind of like their you know their plan of action before they got terminated. So it was yeah, like, oh, this is a bad deal. Got it. And people used to say to me, I'm not kidding. People used to say to me, "Don't come to my office. I'll meet you at Starbucks," because <laughs> they didn't want anyone to know they were having a coach. But now you know it has really shifted. Right now it's you know coaching is a a perk. So yeah. people people brag like, well, I've got a coach, right? Because it's right. an investment. Right. So what's interesting is how low can organizations push coaches down? Because right. a lot of times middle managers really can benefit from coaching. Of course, totally. Right. So totally. then they get the big like better up, right? The, mm -hmm. Where they can kind of get mass coaching, mm -hmm. and it's great. So yes, I think the the philosophy about coaching has changed a lot. Where mm -hmm. coaching is seen as a real benefit. Right. Well, and it is a real benefit, right? Again, if you want to have, you know, if you want to traverse something quickly, find, I mean, you don't go climb uh, Kilimanjaro or Everest or K2 by yourself, right? You go with somebody who's been up and down that thing a hundred, a hundred times or a thousand times, and they coach you along the way. And so too often, and I know, and I'm speaking from my own experience, I get stuck in periods of my life where I plateau in, in like, you know, my weight or my exercise or financially or professional uh, pursuits, you know, I get these plateaus. And interestingly enough, when I'm in those plateaus, I'm, I'm not getting coached, right? I'm not, I don't have a mentor in that area. I don't have anybody that's just helping me kind of get the next step up the mountain, so to speak. And I think it's so beneficial to have, I mean, when I do have that, it's like, and I don't know why I don't do it more, right? But I don't know why I don't seek this out more because it's like, if I want to be good in any area of my life, I've got to have a mentor. I got to have a coach. I got to have at least a peer group that supports getting better at that thing. Yeah, but your life is busy and, you know, <laughs> but but you get your coach when you need it. That's what I'm right. hearing you say is yeah, when, yeah. when it occurs to you like, oh, I'm stuck yeah. on this plateau and I'm ready to move up, then right. you get a coach. And a lot right. of times I think it's that way for leaders, you know, mm -hmm. where they go, I'm ready for my promotion. Like, okay, I'm going to make an action plan. Like, I'm going to really take some action on this. And then they reach out and ask for coaching. Right. And typically, how, are, how do you, because it says, you know, I was reading one of the, um, one of your uh, clients that had worked with you, but they said professional and personal. So typically, how are you, is there a specific style that you use in coaching? Is there a specific methodology that you're using when you coach clients or kind of what typically are you helping them with? Oh, so there were a bunch of questions in there. So oh, in, 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 ter in terms of methodology, <laughs> the one of the joys for me mm -hmm. is that no, I, I don't have one size fits all. I really gotcha. don't. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I always try and accomplish is mm -hmm. before the coaching starts is to get really clear goals. Yes. 
So whether that's with the boss or an HR manager or through a 360 or with the person, you know, like what are we trying to do? Because it's going to be a finite period of time and we're trying to get from point A, what's point B, you know? Right, right. So that's one. The The other question you asked is, what do I typically coach on? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm known as the look and sound of leadership guy, the executive mm -hmm. presence guy. So I'll sometimes, you know, the the person who's kind of in trouble, the disruptive executive, <laughs> a lot of times that's what I'll work on with people mm -hmm. who need to, you know, build better teams and need to manage their relationships. But sometimes it really is like, we want this woman to be a senior vice president but wow. she she doesn't quite feel like it yet. We can't put her in front of the board. Right. Can you polish her up? Polish was, yeah, right. Yeah. So, so a lot of times I do that. So fine-tuning some of the uh, communication skills and mindset, it, sound, it sounds like to me. And executive presence, yeah. which, oh. which is a mindset thing often. Interesting. Yeah, executive presence. What is that, executive presence? Right, it's the look and sound yeah. of leadership. What is it? <laughs> right. Listen, the truth is it's different for everybody. You know, it's kind of like, what is stand-up comedy? I mean, you could look at, you know, six <laughs> different stand-up comics and they're all different, right? Right. So I don't think that there's like a checklist where everybody fits into the box, mm -hmm. but I think there are certain things about being able to communicate clearly, be crisp, answer well, listen well, show some teeth and not be intimidated by your board of directors. There's lots that goes into it, mm -hmm. but, but everybody's is a little different. And again, that's my joy as a coach is it's not like a training where everybody's going to come in and learn the same thing and mm -hmm. kind of come out and be like, everybody's going right, to be like, right. yeah, it's not one size fits all. The other thing that I have observed, that's really interesting. I've been really lucky Mm -hmm. at being able to coach in all kinds of companies, tech companies, mm -hmm. entertainment companies, finance companies, um, where the culture is very different. Mm -hmm. So even from movie studio to movie studio, I live in LA, so I do a lot of the studio work. Mm -hmm. Even from studio to studio, executive presence doesn't always look the same. Right. Because yeah. the culture doesn't look the same, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Very cool. Let's talk about what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're feeling, kind of this, we're you know, three years in, you know, three years into this weirdness, kind of what's your take on what are people dealing with? What, what are you seeing that people are dealing with inside companies? And kind of what's some of that that you've been navigating or helping them navigate? Wow. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. Don't you, don't you love these large open ended questions? No, I just give you like, I do. Okay, yeah, because yes, yes. there's, there's so much. So I'll much tell there. you, I'll tell you one of the things that has been fascinating. So mm -hmm. you and I are talking here in December mm -hmm. of 2022. Right. There is, people are all over the map about what return to work means. Right. Yep. And I mean, all over the map. Mm -hmm. Some people are like, we're never coming back to work. Some people are, <laughs> you know, everybody's coming back to work one day a week. I talked to a woman who said, we're coming back to work one day a week but we can only come in the day we're assigned because they've reduced our office space and everybody is sharing a desk. So we have no permanent spaces. Right. So I, I don't even know where I'm going to sit, but if I don't show up on Tuesday, if I show up on Thursday, there's no space for me. And I was like, Whoa, that's intense. You know? Right. Yeah. And then I've got a North American president in, in New York city who said, why isn't everybody back? <laughs> and I thought, Oh my goodness, really? Are you not listening to your people? You know? So it's like, they're right. all over the map. That's one of the things I see is all this kind of, it's not chaos so much as it's not clear and there's no right. uniformity and there are no trends. Right. Everybody so is new. doing it differently. Yeah, everybody's doing it differently. The other thing that I've seen is a real striving to figure out how to build remote relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. One of the things that I think everybody agrees is missing is water cooler moments, hallway right. conversations, yep. right? right? Dropping by your office and talking. Yeah. And then suddenly we both go, oh, you know what we should do? We should talk to Brian about X, right? I mean, right. that stuff doesn't happen. And so there's a real lack of that kind of spontaneous creativity, mm -hmm. that kind of productivity that only happens when you're with each other. And so productivity is actually going down. And all. Oh, yeah. And relationships are going down. I can right? see the relationship thing. I'm surprised productivity is going down. And uh, how, explain that to me more, how that how that's working. Well, because I think there's so much of the social lubricant that kept the wheels turning. 
Mm. The, the five minutes in the room before the boss comes in and, right. and, and the team is talking among each other and right. somebody goes, oh, that meeting last week in Atlanta was such a disaster and everybody Got gets it. to kind of think about it out loud. Right. Well, that that just never happens anymore. That conversation just doesn't, doesn't happen. Exist. Right. So we it's harder to learn. It's harder mm-hmm. to share. Mm-hmm. Right. One of the things that I'm advocating with my clients and mm-hmm. I talk about it on my podcast is one of the things that I am asking my team leaders to do mm-hmm. is to ask their people to have virtual coffees with each other right. without talk, without talking about work. Right. Just, but that literally we have to get on each other's calendar, what we might yeah, have done yeah. automatically. Right. Now, 30 minutes, planned. 45 minutes, 60 minutes, where we're just going to, you know, Matt and I are just going to talk on Tuesday, right? Right. And we're just going to chat about whatever the hell, because we can't do that anymore. And I believe it really does help. And that's a productivity issue because I, you and I build trust. We build mm-hmm. language. I know how you're thinking about stuff. I know where you are. All those, like people, I don't know. I used to hear all the time that teams used to have, you know, Monday morning huddles for 15 right. minutes, right? right? Everybody, mm-hmm. nobody would sit down. Everybody come in the conference yep. room. We, yeah, we call it a stand-up meeting. We have those in our business still, yeah. But they're hard to do if you're not in person. Well, right, right? exactly. Yeah, it, it it isn't the same, and because of what happens on our audio on Zoom and stuff, mm-hmm. we can't all talk at the same time. But in a room, we can, and we can hear each other. So all those dynamics have changed, and I do think it makes us less productive and yes. less connected. Yeah, definitely. No, I can definitely see the the less connected, but it's a it's almost like heaven for introverts, but. <laughs> But but I, because I've found that I am one, that's the thing I discovered, and I've shared that on, on this show several times. I found that I was an introvert, or I've, I've developed introverted tendencies, and COVID highlighted those where I was like, oh, and I think part of it was safety issue. It just felt, uh, I was you know going through some stuff, and it felt safer to some degree because I was very unsure, but I don't know that it was healthier. I think it, was, it felt safe. I don't know that it was healthy. Um, right. Those two things uh, didn't necessarily coexist, but... But yeah, that's interesting. And so, yeah, how do we create those stand-up meetings is actually what we call them. I'm in health. I've got a healthcare company. And so our healthcare company literally never closed, right? Where we take care of people 24-7. And so, you know, we still do and did uh, stand-ups and they became more critical because it was like, what are we dealing with today, right? What What's the new thing that, the, that we're supposed to, what's the new protocols? What's the new thing we're supposed to do today to help take care of people? And were and you so, in person or were you virtual? Well, they were in person. I was virtual because I couldn't go into the building. So it was only essential staff, right? During the, that period of time. So none of none of the, the C-suite could go into the buildings because we didn't want to expose people, right? That I mean, if we can't allow families to go in during that period of time, we couldn't, right? So we couldn't allow families to go in. So we couldn't justify going into a building. So, but the wow. staff in the building was still having stand-ups because everybody was, you know, masked up and everything back then. But, you know, we, it's, so we're in the nursing home business and assisted living. And so, you know, we were in the, 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 the crux of the deal. We were ground zero for COVID. So at the front lines, I should say, not ground zero, but at the front lines. I'm looking at, you know, how do we build out more of a virtual team uh, for some of the stuff that we do, not in the healthcare space, but some of the education space. And I'm like, and so how do you get those? And I've, I've noticed, I've talked to other people that manage it, you know, smaller teams, right? Not huge companies, but smaller teams by people, 10 people. And, and it seems like that they have either built in time for it if they're successful or find a way to to have those, but you almost need just like open think space time, like where we all just get on a call and there is no agenda or something, right? It's just kind of like a, what do we want to talk about today? Even though it's weird or uncomfortable, let's just get into some stuff. Yeah, it could be. And it's hard because everybody's calendar is so kind of goofy, right? Because, because nothing is spontaneous anymore. Right. I can't just get out of my chair and walk down the hall Right. And see what happens, right? Like on right. my way to the men's room, there's going to be something that happens that's going to make me better. Right. And that yep. doesn't happen anymore. I mean, now I get out of my chair, I go to the men's room, and it's just me and the dog, you know? It's like, <laughs> right. And then you come back. Right. And I get that now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I, yeah, that make complete sense because a lot of times it would just be the mental break, right? If you're sitting there, you know, in the zone for a while and you're just like, okay, I got to get up and just go talk to, I just got to, you know, kind of, or, or just I have this idea and I want to go share it real quick because I, right. want, I want some instant feedback and then you're not getting that instant feedback. So there's just this point of, yeah. So yeah. How to, and, and so you're, you're coaching some of your leaders on just meeting one-on-one, it sounds like, with their peers. 
Right. Yeah. Are there other? The, the other thing that I'm yeah. pushing is uh-huh. helping leaders have creative meetings. Mm-hmm. Right. So that they're becoming better facilitators and they're not just agenda runners. Right. But to actually how to prompt a meaningful discussion about stuff so mm-hmm. that people can get talking. There's lots of ways to do it. The, pe- the place where I send people most is liberating structures. Mm-hmm. liberatingstructures.com mm-hmm. it's it's brilliant uh simple ways to get people talking and listening to each other and i've been using it as a facilitator i've been using th- those tools for oh my god a long long time mm-hmm. but liberating structures is really written for people who are not facilitators not professional facilitators mm-hmm. and i'm encouraging my leaders to say mm-hmm. no you need to engage your people in in meaningful dialogue and what it's not that? just it's not just like ask one good open ended question. It isn't just that. It's 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 thoughtful. Go ahead. You've got to. Go well, 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 I've never heard of this. So this liberating structures dot com. What exactly is it? So here's their purpose is mm-hmm. to help people have meaningful conversations in their teams, in their groups. Mm-hmm. So it's all kinds of structures and structures just means a, a kind of a format activity. Right. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. With different outcomes different and so you can look at their menu of lists and there's Mm. just all kinds of things that you might want to achieve in a meeting they've Mm. got oh my god probably 30 of them or more Mm. and you can just pick one and some of them take 15 minutes some of them take 60 minutes a couple Mm. of them take 90 minutes but the point is that it gives you a a way to get people talking and thinking can i give you a really simple example i would love it no no i love examples you can so give me a this, complex example if you want to. I'm good. No, this one's really simple because it, uh-huh. oh my, and you talked about being an introvert. It's, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Uh-huh. So I can do this in a room with people or I can do it online with people and I'll uh-huh. give it to you as an online example. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So here's one of the things that I'm aware of. Uh, I'm an extrovert. You say you're an introvert. Uh-huh. When I'm running a team, uh-huh. I am aware that when I throw an open-ended question into the room, a lot of times the extroverts yeah. By the time I have finished the question, the extroverts are ready to talk, <laughs> right. right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah well, they've me, got me, ideas. Me, me next. Well, yeah. well, and they're just bursting with ideas yeah. and they're ready right. to talk. They haven't really thought it out, but they're no, going to think all. while they're talking. <laughs> exactly, right? exactly. That's how they process. Right. Great. What it does is it allows the, so the extroverts in the room are just yes. Yes. blabbing, right? Yep. yep, yep. What happens is the introverts get a pass. Right, of course. Yeah. They don't speak and they don't even think about their thinking because they're just watching the movie. It's entertainment. Yeah, it's an entertainment. Yeah. Right. Now, some introverts are frustrated by that. Some introverts are like, I never get a chance to speak. Right. Some introverts are actually relieved. Yes. Like, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> yeah, oh, great. Like, oh, great. I, I get... I'm entertained. Bring the popcorn. I could, you know, bring the, can I get a recliner? This is a great movie. <laughs> right. And, and I don't have to participate. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. Here's the variation. And I got this from Liberating Structures. Mm-hmm. You ask a question, you say 60 seconds of silence. Right. Which everybody, everybody uncomfortable. <laughs> everybody, no, write down your thoughts. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yeah. And then, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So on when I'm on, let's say, a Zoom call, mm-hmm. what I say is everybody's going to go on mute, including me, for 60 mm-hmm. seconds. Don't right. unmute until I tell you to. And use the 60 seconds to get your thinking organized. Oh, and wow. what happens is when everybody comes off mute, the introverts are in the same starting blocks. Right, because now they have something written down that they can share, right? And And then everybody shares, right? Yeah. Same thing in a room, 60 seconds of silence, don't talk, Mm -hmm. everybody write. And what's really interesting is more voices get heard, different voices get heard. Mm -hmm. Even the extroverts get time to organize their Mm -hmm. thinking instead of thinking out loud. Right. It's it's just incredibly simple and really Mm -hmm. helpful. And you learned that from liberating structures. Yep. I love it. I'm going to check that out. That's cool. And this isn't an ad or promotion. I didn't know you were going to say that. And we're not getting sponsored by liberating structures. Um, and, but- and by the way, they give their stuff away for free. These oh. are some, ac- oh no, these are some academics who just went, we have to make a better world. And they've been oh, putting this it. stuff into the world. Oh, their stuff is great. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to definitely check that out because I've been looking at doing some stuff in group dynamics. I've been a part of a, I guess you call it small group mastermind, whatever you want to call it for like 15 years. And I've noticed the benefit to myself, but it's like, how do you introduce this to people who've never experienced it before? Right. It's just, there's so much power in that peer networking 
um, especially when you're doing it over long periods of time. Like the, yeah. my cur- like my current group, we've been together as a group, most of us for four years and some, and then we introduced two new people in for, I think three years. But I mean, that's some longevity where you're starting to learn kids' names, schools, you know, you know, how jacked up their childhood was. I mean, you're, you're getting into the depth and these, this is under the auspices of business. But when you get into it, you know, I, I used to, th- people always used to say when I was grow- growing up in the business world, it was like, um, you know, you, business and personal, those are two separate things. So I'm like, there is nothing more personal about life than business. <laughs> right? <laughs> you're right. I, I mean, there, you're just, you live 30%, 40% of your life, at least, if not more, is consumed by this thing we call business or work. How can you not, I mean, you're a person, how can it not be personal? Well, and again the the leaders that we really want to follow bring themselves exactly. to the work right. and there was a big push i mean certainly before covid it's not so much during covid but mm-hmm. a big push of being authentic right mm-hmm. yep. and put yourself in your work so it's right. like yeah no i mean there is no separation and the thing that i by the way i have a mastermind where we're probably 15 years together oh, beautiful. where where we hold each other's histories and yes. it's incredibly oh, meaningful where, you know, I'll say something and then somebody will say to me, you know, I remember you said that mm-hmm. about seven years ago when you were in that other thing and blah, blah. And right. I'll go, oh, my gosh, you're right. right. And it's just so meaningful for somebody to have remembered and, that. And oh, it's helpful. Can I ask you a question? Would you be open to me asking some questions around that mastermind thing specifically? Sure, of course. Because, you know, I was somebody I was on the podcast, uh, t- uh, Tara uh, Pilling was on our podcast and she actually works with mastermind groups. And she referred me back to a book that I had read 20 years ago, maybe 25, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And I was just like, you know what? I, it's it's kind of like one of those books. You're like, oh yeah, I, I read that. You know, da, 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 da. And then I started reading it again, like last week. And I'm like, I'm reading a chapter a day. I'm just like so sucked in. I'm like, it's this because it's been 30 years, right? Since I read this, literally 30 years. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much good stuff in here. But it really talks mm-hmm. about mastermind peer groups. You know, like Henry Ford, he was surrounded. I mean, he was talking to, um, oh, was it Edison? Uh, but he had like some high thinking people, but in different industries that he would just travel with on vacation for like three months. They would just take cars and go driving and touring. And so it was just so interesting. I thought, and then I looked at my own life and the peer group I've been a part of. And I'm just like, wow, I, I mean- it, it's kind of back to the old uh, saying, you know, you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, go with, you know, a tribe or a team, right? And so, so your mastermind group, what was, what is the, what was the umbrella that you formed under? What was kind of the, why are we coming together? We were all coaches looking to grow our business. And how many people are in that? We started with eight uh-huh. and we're down to five. Just through life circumstances or just uh-huh yeah yeah and yeah, and, yeah. and you chosen not to bring the number back to eight you just said we're good with who we are partly because of the longevity right it's hard to bring in and also by the way 15 years on we're all at different stages of our lives and our careers i mean one person she's still in the group but she's retired of course yeah. right so it's right. like you know it's a whole different conversation with her right but of course but so, I mean, that's part of it of like, no, we're not looking to just right. stay at an arbitrary number of eight, it, right. it, you know, like, no, that number has no magic on it. And then how often do you meet? We meet once a month. Once a month. And then how long is that meeting? Uh, we, specific, aren't that's it? okay. We block two hours. Two hours. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have a format that you follow or is it kind of open? It is a format in that you get, depending on how many people are in mm-hmm. today, X amount of time. You get, you know, 23 minutes. Timer starts now. Whatever you want to talk about. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Well, I think, and and I guess what was, because I'm really, the reason I'm asking a press moment, because as a listener, as somebody listening here, but as our listeners, again, this goes back to that. How do we get better at anything? How do we get better at any area of our life? Or in this case, when we're talking mastermind, all areas of our life. And it's through shared experience. It's through learning, you know, do you want to learn the mistakes yourself or do you want to have other people's input so that you can at least have some navigation through, okay, I'm getting ready to go through whatever this is. If it's a leadership challenge, if it's a personal challenge, you're having problems with your kids, whatever the thing is, how do you get good information that you can kind of, I mean, you know, the internet's just like an information whore, right? It's just like tons and tons of stuff. Right, unfiltered. 
Uh, but but yeah, how do you know that any of this stuff works, right? And so somebody posting on Facebook or social media or a blog or whatever, yeah, that's great. But you, you kind of need to know the people and the context and the to get the real depth of okay, how do I apply this to my life, right? And I think that's what you get in a mastermind group. You're getting depth, right? You're getting value and, and various points of view. And, I mean, and various points of view. There right? is one woman in our group. I mean, it's hilarious. She is such a contrarian. I mean, she has such a different point of view from all of us. Right. And we and we often go to her first because right. because we have found that her point of view is so valuable and helpful because right. none of us would have ever thought of that. And, and I think that was the critical thing that they told us in the formation. I'm in YPO, Young Presidents Organization. Uh -huh. They have forum groups in YPO. Sure. So mine yeah. is a forum group. And so they did tell us that specifically in the beginning. I was one of the founders of our specific group. And they in the beginning, they said, you want to find people as diverse as you can that think differently than you, because otherwise you just have a bunch of yes people. You just have a bunch of people that say, yeah, we all grew up in the same place and we went to the same school. And so you're not getting that diversity of thought. So how do you grow your mind? How do you grow your thought? How do you grow your awareness? Right. Because so really they challenged us as a, uh, you know, as a group to find or when we bring it, we do bring in new people into ours. But when we do, we look for that diversity of thought. You know, how, how are they? Wh what's their life experience? Right. Is their life experience different than mine? Because that's what I'm looking for to get that more well-rounded part of me. Great. I'm yeah, so glad for you. That. I don't know if there's any question in there. That was <laughs> no, but I, but I listen. I'm with you. One of the things that's interesting for me when I coach senior leaders, yes. right, people at the top of a big pyramid, yeah, who do they have to talk to? Exactly. Oh sure. my! Now they can talk to me, and that's great. But look, I've never run a company right. with yep. multiple divisions with yep. a you know publicly <laughs> traded stock and blah blah blah. Like so, I've got certain information that they can't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But I'm not their peer. Right. And well, that's and very, uh, very and, wise of you to show them that. Well, yeah. And we'll often talk about it of like, I mean, I just was talking to a woman, a CFO the other day, and, and I was like, what other CFOs are you talking to? Right. Exactly. And, and she was like, no, I know I used to and I don't. And she was like, I got to get back on that. It was like, yeah, that would really help her. And again, this is a woman who is incredibly busy, who's mm -hmm. got a pretty complex life outside of work. Of course. But she understands it, it'll be hard to find time to add that, but she understands the value of it. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, I can't imagine navigating the last 15 years of my life without that group. Just what it, how, like, I, I, I can just think time and time again, like our current CEO who runs our healthcare company came from kind of thoughts from that group, right? Well, why don't you, you know, and, you know, just. <laughs> leadership programs that I've gone through have come from that group, right? And books that I read come from that group. Like the other day, I was saying something, they were like, oh, you need to read um, uh, Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy's book, Who Not How. And, and they were like, it's super simple. It's like, almost like who moved your cheese? They said, it's super simple. But man, once you start looking at some, thinking about it, it's like restructures the brain a little bit. It's like, I need to collaborate with people that shouldn't try to learn everything myself. And that's so basic. And I've been around a lot, but, but it's true. So that group is are groups of people that, you know, if you want to get better at something, if you don't want to get better, you don't have to have a group. <laughs> but if you want to get better, you probably need a group of people or at the very, very minimum, a good coach. Or right. Either way, or and they're different, yeah. right? They're going right. to add different value. Right. Yeah. One's going to be more focused on you specifically. The others, you're doing life together. You're doing business, you know, through life together, whatever that is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you my uh, kind of uh, question I've been using lately, which I have found I always love the answer and the answer always surprises me of every guest. And when I have guests on, this is my new like closing type question, which is um, there's 8 billion people now. There's 8 billion of us, you know, people, walk, people walking around with bones and skin and all that fun stuff or rolling around or laying around or whatever. There's 8 billion of us that are breathing on this earth right now. And if Tom has the ability to broadcast one message to all 8 billion people to, to have the greatest impact, what would that message be? To all 8 billion people. So we're not mm -hmm. even just talking business nope. folks. We're, we're nope. talking nope. This kids, is your, moms, dads, everybody. This is your impact. This, is, this would be your impact on the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. Listen more. Listen more. I love it. See, and it's always new. And I, I'll just tell you why for me. Feel free. Yes, please expand on it. Yes, please do. So there's two parts to this. As a coach, I have learned 
I mean, I've been coaching for more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. I ask so many more questions now than I did even five years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I have really learned. It's hard though, after you've found a question to ask, it's, it's hard to just drop it and listen mm -hmm. and listen in a way that can help you connect other things that have been said. Mm -hmm. That's hard. It's a learned skill. It's a muscle. Mm -hmm. And in my family, we love each other. We're together a lot. We see each other a lot. We travel together. We do a lot together. Mm -hmm. But listening, it's hard. I think I know what <laughs> I think I know what my niece is going to say. I think I know right. what my daughter is going to say. Like, right. you know what I mean? Or yeah. you'll like do something as you're passing yeah. the potato salad, and you'd right. kind of listen with half an ear. But to really, literally, really sit down mm -hmm. and either interview someone or talk to someone and really listen like, how's that project going that you told me about? Um, how's it going with your twins? I mean, whatever. And then to not give advice, just to listen. Oh my goodness, it's transformative. It's listening to learn is so hard and so meaningful. And, and I love how you just said that phrase, listening to learn. That's different than listening. To me, listening to learn is listening with intention. So I love that phrase. I think that should be a book listening. To, that should be your book listening to learn because that reframes it. Right. Because it was the way I, I just want to tell you where that comes from. For me, yeah, I talk uh -huh. about this all the time with my clients that there's three ways that we listen in the world. Mm -hmm. We listen to win, <laughs> right? Like, like when we're negotiating, yes, yes, right? Of course. Yeah. We're looking for weaknesses. Yeah. Or we're trying to make a point or we're trying yeah. to score. I mean, it could be good and it could be bad. Right. But, right, yes. but we listen to win and that's, yep. yep. We listen to fix. Mm -hmm. Like I have advice for you. I know what you should do. <laughs> have you tried this? Right. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. And where somebody comes to you and says, Matt, help me think about this. Like, well, we've got this problem. Mm -hmm. You're listening to fix. You're being asked to listen to fix. Right. And then there's listening to learn just curiosity. Right. It's we, I think we spend most of our time in the first two. Right. We of course. Oh, we yeah. We listen to win or we listen to fix. Yeah. Listening to learn. That's hard. And it's something well, that you have to really choose. But it feels good. It was, the weird thing was I was resisting the, the you know, the first two, because I'm, you know, an expert at right, listening to <laughs> listening to win and <laughs> listening to fix. You you just asked my wife. Um, but <laughs> listening, you know, and she's very patient with me and kind, and that's why I love her. Um, and listening to learn, but it, listening to learn shifted literally when you said it, it just shifted something in my brain. And I went, wow, that is so pro so simple to say, but so profound to contemplate on because now I have to be present. Now I have to be open. Now I have to kind of quiet down my inner critic, my inner, like, what am I going to say next? What's the next, you know, I want to sound smart. I want to sound funny. Da, da, how am I going to, how am I going to manipulate this situation for my better good? Right. Two, if I'm listening to learn, it's like, wow, you know, how am I learning from this person in this situation, which is being so present, but also serving them. It seems very. Right. It's, oh, be, yes, it is being of service. Yeah. And that feels, that feels, I feel that, that that's a different shift that feels, yeah. How am I listening to learn? And, and, and you can be selfish in that. I really want to learn from this person, right? What value am I going to, but listening to learn means I'm open to whatever they're wanting to teach also, right? Whatever they're conveying, not just what I want to learn. Right? One of the gifts that I think podcasts have given us is uh -huh. we've, 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 become interested in each other's stories, yes. whether it's something like the moth, that's an actual storytelling event, mm -hmm. or, or just, you know, true crime where it's a story right, unfolding. Yeah. I think we all have learned that actually people have interesting stories. Right. And so this listening to learn, like, I just want to know what's going on with you. I, I think people get it on some level, but mm -hmm. it is, it, you use the word intention. If you mm -hmm. don't choose it, it won't happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it'd be, yeah, it's very intentional because you gotta, gotta just shut that, you know, shut down all that other stuff or just uh, not shut it down, choose to not engage in that other stuff. If I'm listening to learn, I'm choosing not to engage in trying to fix this problem, which they say that's a huge problem between, you know, in a marriage, right? Men are always trying to fix every little thing because that's what we think is going to make it work versus if I'm listening to learn now, I'm not engaged in what I'm going to do next or what's she going to say and what am I going to do with that? It's more about, okay, I'm actually experiencing my wife or experiencing my husband or my spouse or whatever, right? It, it's 
That's beautiful. I think that's, like I said, that should be a book. On it. And I want to see the Tom Henschel li listen to learn book. That's what I want to see. Well, it's just listen to the podcast and that, <laughs> <laughs> instead of writing. Yes, yes. Well, we'll, we'll we're just going to transcribe it and I'll put it there in you go. for me. Put it okay. in for me. It'll make me feel good. And was there a second part to that? You said there was two parts, but is the list or is that, have we captured all of it? Yeah, we did. Okay, perfect. Because that was a lot of, that a lot of, a lot of good value. So I love that. So all 8 billion people, we need to, to learn or listen to learn. I wrote that down and circled it, circled it. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Well, Tom, thank you for your time today. Thank you for coming on our show. I've gained a ton of value. I took, I took a lot of notes. I appreciate. And if people want to learn more about you and what you do or visit with you about your coaching and your consulting, they can go to your podcast, which is the look and sound of leadership. So you can find that on your iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. And then I'll let you, I've saw several different websites. So what's the best website to go to, to kind of connect with you or the best way to connect with you? So we have lots of free re resources on the Essential Communications website. That's the name okay. of the company. It's essentialcom.com. Gotcha. Okay. And there's lots there that you can just download and use and take for yourself. I love that. And certainly thank you for the liberating structures today. Also, that I think that's a very valuable, I think for all of us, um, that's kind of, I won't say an easy button, but it is in a way an easy button for maybe navigating some of these Zoom calls and these Zoom meetings and how do we open some conversations up that normally wouldn't get opened up so that we can get back to being productive and through that, through connection and through communication. So. Oh, great. I'm so glad. I'm, I had no idea we were going to talk about that, but I'm so glad we did. <laughs> All right, Tom. Well, thank you for that. And, and thank gonna... you. Thank you for being a part of the Bright Vibe podcast. For more information, go to brightvibe.com. That's B-R-I-T-E, vibe, V-I-B-E.com. Thank you for listening.